I hadn't seen anything like it before, and, and I can see it quite clearly now. As clear as I can see you, climbing up, just the two of us, and uh, we were told of 150 plus. That's a lot of aeroplanes in those days. And I looked ahead into the distance and there it was, like a lot of gnats on a summer evening uh, coming towards us. And my, my reaction was, you know, where on earth do we start with this lot? What do we do? And the answer was to go straight in. The Battle of Britain is now being regarded as one of the iconic battles of history and I think it's quite true to say that had we not won this battle, because we did win it, the Germans may well have invaded and uh, life in this country and in fact around the world would have been vastly different. We knew we were fighting pretty uh, heavy odds, the, the odds being very much against us. Uh, people were frightened. Constant bombing, mortal combat, and the threat of invasion were very real indeed, believe me. I never thought we were going to be beaten because when you're young, defeat doesn't sort of enter your mind. I think my family must have been quite horrified to think that their son was had volunteered for, for this, what was obviously a dangerous thing. On the other hand, my father fought in the trenches of the First World War. Uh, he knew what it was all about. And so I think probably a mixture of, of trepidation and, and pride. The papers were showing that uh, clouds were gathering over Central Europe and everybody was talking about uh, what we might have to do to defend ourselves in case something happened. And I noticed that uh, a lot of friends and so on were, were beginning to join up. I, I think my mother was probably rather cut up because she lost her brother at Arras in the First World War. And uh, so she was a bit sensitive about her children uh, uh, joining up. Nevertheless, uh, I, th I think all in all, uh, it, it was accepted. But, uh, there was nothing strange about it. In the early 30s, I was motoring past Croydon Airport with a friend and saw a notice up, flights five shillings. So I said, come on, let's go and have a flight. And uh, we had a flight and to see the ground below me for the first time ever, I was hooked. It naturally uh, felt to me that uh, I would follow in the path of the heroes, you know, uh, like Manak and all the other people. And I decided to join the Air Force at the age of 17 and three quarters. They found out eventually that uh, Dowding or Churchill or somebody had cancelled the postings from the flying training school that were on that day or that week or whatever it was. And we were to be sent straight to squadrons because they were getting rather short of pilots after the Dunkirk. Those days you joined as an AC2, which was the lowest rank in the Air Force. But because nobody under the rank of sergeant was allowed to fly a plane, I was made a sergeant the next day. It was about the 9th or 10th of September when we, I first saw my first German airplanes and they were fighters, some 109s. We went in to attack them, with great excitement and thrill, but unfortunately I don't think I hit anything because it was the first time I'd fired shots in anger. Troll, uh, who were directing us, were very good and they got us off early enough to get uh, up 2,000 feet above the raid coming in and into the sun uh, so that we were had the sun behind us. I mean, those two factors were very, very important and, uh, and they managed that for us. This was the first time I'd ever seen a, a, a ger one German plane, let alone a hundred and something of them. The first, first time I saw a German aircraft was when uh, we were on a training flight. We climbed up to about 15,000 feet and received a message on the radio to say that there was a bandit in the area. And uh, we were vectored, vectored onto this thing. I'd, ne I'd never fired the guns on a Spitfire. I, had, I didn't even know how to work the gun sight. That hadn't yet been explained to me. We would uh, intercept German aircraft amounting to about 100, 150, 200 aircraft. And we would look left and right of us 
and see 11 companions, at which time we all said to ourselves, my God, what are we doing? Uh, where do we start? Well, I think probably the narrowest escape I had was when we went into a crowd of ME-110s, which were twin-engine fighter bombers um, over the south of England. And I went in and opened fire to attack them, and the whole of my engine blew up in front of me. Um, there were no flames or anything, uh, and, but I thought I'd been shot. Uh, and so I pulled out of the action, glided down. I had no engine or anything like that and managed to force land. Uh, and I was jolly lucky that the thing didn't burst into flames because um, I wouldn't be here today if it had done. I had a, a really horrific crash on my first solo night flight after only 40 minutes instruction in, in complete blackout conditions. And the plane was a complete write-off. And I hit the ground with such force that the engine fell off and, was, and, and finished up about 100 yards away, which saved my life. Had the engine still been there, obviously the plane would have caught fire and I would have been killed. Well, without Keith Park, the, the Battle of Britain would never have been won. There was that famous occasion when Churchill visited Uxbridge and was in the operations room when every single squadron was in the air. And Churchill turned to Keith Park and said, and what reserves do we have? Keith Park said, none. Every squadron and every pilot was flying on that day. It was Keith and his controllers and so on who controlled the battle. So, so the battle was, well, it was one at the sharp end by us, but at the back end it was Park and Dowding's planning, uh, pre-war planning and so on, that enabled victory to come our way. He, could, he used to come around, fly around all the stations and chat to the chaps and so on. He was a wonderful bloke. Mm. Now the miracle of the Battle of Britain was that our system was so good that uh, we were never short of aircraft. And if we finish up at the end of the day with five, we'd be back to full strength by the afternoon of the following day. It's easy to bomb an airfield, but it's very difficult to put it out of action. Biggin Hill, to my knowledge, while we were there, never stopped operating its Spitfires at full throttle. And it's only in the last 20 odd years that this has come back and the historians have got hold of all the facts and figures and so on. And it is now recognized after 70 years as one of the major battles of history. I think it's great that the Royal Mint, which is so well known around the world uh, with its integrity, uh, is taking on uh, producing a coin to commemorate this, this, this great battle. And we're truly grateful for the support that we're getting from the Royal Mint. I'm reminded of, um, of the, the tenseness, the excitement, the fear and so on that went into any fighter pilot when he's going into action because this is what the coin depicts the squadron getting ready probably to go down and attack. I think it's the most beautiful design, but I think it's so appropriate that the, that the 70th anniversary is, is to be marked by the issue of such a special coin. Anything that perpetuates uh, the event should be applauded. Had it not been for the Battle of Britain, they wouldn't be here today. We certainly wouldn't have had a multiracial society. Hitler wouldn't have allowed that. And the world would have been a very, very different place.